Well, good afternoon, friends. It's great to be with you again. Thanks for being flexible as I haven't gotten this video out to you until this afternoon. So I hope your week's been great. And again, just wanted to offer a great welcome to all of you. What you're doing in small groups facilitating is really a step for you in the direction of discipling others. Disciple making takes all different forms and some of that's one-on-one, -on -one, some of that's in groups, some of that is in front of a large group of people. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for being obedient to the Lord. And just know that where God has placed you in your groups, He has already set you apart for that purpose. So welcome to the team. Welcome to being a part of the great journey of fellow disciple makers, teaching people and equipping them to also read the Bible and see what it says. So this week in small groups, we've got a tremendous example of how theology impacts how we approach others. And really, it starts with how do we view Jesus? What do we think about him? What is our default way? Is it thinking of him as fully God? Is it thinking about him as fully man? And this often comes up when we talk about the anger and wrath of God. You know, when we think even about God being jealous, as he describes himself in the Old Testament and New Testament, it doesn't seem something that makes sense to us. It seems like a human emotion that is all about pride and arrogance. And so we struggle to describe God to others when we're trying to talk about the fact that he's jealous. Well, in the same way, this kind of uh, trickles into when we talk about Jesus having anger. When we think of anger, often we think of it as just unqualified and somebody that just flies off the handle that can't be controlled. And here we find in the scriptures that Jesus is angry. He's angry about what's going on with the Pharisees and Sadducees in Matthew 23. We find that he's angry about what happens to Lazarus and death in John 11. And so we find that Jesus can be full of compassion, which means that he is merciful and can be angry at the exact same time. Now, that's difficult for us to kind of fit our brains around that idea, but focus in on this, that God is simple. Now, what I mean by that is God is not simple as something that we can understand exclusively and it's easy to talk about God. What is meant by the fact that God is simple is meaning that he's not divided into parts. So he doesn't have 100% mercy, and then when he's showing mercy that he's at 50% or 25% or 0% wrath. Or that God, that Jesus is 100% angry and now his mercy is down to 0%. God is not divided by parts. Jesus is not divided by parts. It is called the simple attribute of God, that he cannot be divided into parts. And this gives us great comfort because Jesus in his compassion is fully merciful and fully angry at the same time. And so this can be a great comfort to us, knowing that Jesus is capable of all emotions all at the same time. What a great comfort this is to us. So just keep up the great work in small groups. This week, please pray for your groups. And then I would like to challenge you in your groups to read John chapter 11. And we're going to be reading verses 28 through 38. This really focuses on Lazarus and focuses on Jesus and just his feeling in his gut that he was angry um, about what death was doing. So focus on what death had accomplished, what sin had really accomplished, that it required death. And that's what Jesus is really angry about. So focus on that portion as you're discussing. So read it together as a group and then discuss that text, and then move on to the video, and then uh, discuss the questions in the uh, small group study. So again, just wanted to encourage you, and I just want to say thank you again for joining all of us in this work. Just know that be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in God's work, because our labor is never in vain when it's done in God's name. So stay strong in the Lord. Remember to rest in Jesus, rest in his full humanity, his full godhood, and just who he is, and just continue to have your mouth drop open in worship of who Jesus is 
how he describes himself in the scriptures. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye now. Chapters 10 through 12 of Gentle and Lowly really focus on three more facets to the diamond of the heart of Christ. The beauty of his gentle heart, the emotional life within the Lord Jesus that reflects his heart, and then thirdly, his heart as a friend to those who are his own. In chapter 10 then, with regard to the beauty of Christ's heart, across the pages of church history, it's really Jonathan Edwards who more than anyone helps us to see that what we are drawn into as we are drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ isn't mainly his greatness and his majesty, though we do love and revere that, but actually what draws us in is mainly his goodness, not so much his might, though he is mighty, but his mercy. We care about truth. We care deeply about truth. We want to have clear and precise doctrine in how we believe, how we think about God and Christ. We care about truth, but we are allured by beauty. Beauty is what draws us in. Just as our physical eyes and mind are drawn physically to beauty, the the beauty of a sunset or a a beautiful uh, picture, In a similar way, our hearts, our souls, are drawn to spiritual beauty. We're drawn into it. And really what I'm asking you to do in chapter 10 of the book is I'm asking you to romance the heart of Christ. Consider it. Ponder it. Let it draw you in. The heart of Jesus Christ isn't just something to put on a Petri dish with a white lab coat on under a microscope to analyze, though we do want to very closely uh, deeply study what the scripture says about the Lord Jesus, but also to be drawn in, to let his beauty um, woo us and win us over to him. And the reason for that is he is a person. He's not a machine. He's a person. And one reality to his personhood is that he has emotions. And that brings us to chapter 11. Chapter 11 of the book is inspired by the old Princeton theologian Warfield, B.B. Warfield, who wrote a famous article in 1912 called On the Emotional Life of Our Lord, where he looked at the emotions, according to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the emotions of Jesus Christ. And he said, really, three bubble up to the surface most clearly and obviously, joy, anger, and compassion. And Warfield concludes the most common, the recurring theme, the resounding drum of Christ's emotional life, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is the emotion of compassion. What Warfield points out is that as we march through the four Gospels and look at what Jesus Christ does and is, how he reacts to sinners and sufferers, what we see is compassion ignites within him as he looks at people in anguish, people in sin, people laden down with guilt and shame and regret and remorse. What ignites, what explodes within him is centrally the emotion of compassion. The verb that is used there in the New Testament refers to the innermost being, the, the uh, actually literally your, your kidneys or your guts, what you feel viscerally is the verb that is used there in the New Testament to speak of Christ's compassion flowing out of him. And one of the key insights that Warfield gives us as he's studying the Gospels and talking about the emotional life of our Lord is that Jesus was the one perfectly, truly human. So compassion didn't flow out of him just because he was God, but actually as an an emotion-laden, an emotional human being, truly human, He experienced compassion. He also experienced anger. And Warfield shows that when Christ was walking around, when he saw someone being mistreated, actually righteous indignation, anger, uh, flowed up out of him just as compassion did. Warfield goes to John chapter 11, where there's a very striking example of this, where Jesus shows up, Lazarus, his friend, Lazarus has died. 
And the text says in John chapter 11 that Jesus was, actually it's a word that means anger. He was feeling indignant. Uh, the ESV translates it there in John eleven thirty three and 38. He was deeply moved in his spirit, but it's not just kind of neutrally deeply moved. It's he's fiercely angry. He's uh, distressed. He's perplexed. He's indignant at death. So when Christ, not only when he sees someone in distress, his heart of compassion goes out to him, but anger at the injustice of the way people are treated in the wake of the fall and at their own distress and sinfulness and suffering, he feels a certain righteous indignation there as well over that. Now, here's what I want you to know as you are working through these chapters in the book. Jesus Christ is the same now in heaven for you as he was in John 11 or anywhere that we drop down into Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The same compassionate, the same uh, anger on your behalf, Christ, if you are one with him, that same emotional Christ, righteous emotions, not sinfully um, reacting in a wrong way, but he is neither sinfully underreacting nor sinfully overreacting. He is acting exactly the way that is right, given your own condition. The same Jesus Christ that we see walking around on two legs in the Gospels is the Christ who is still truly human for you and still fully feeling for you now in heaven. He is not an unfeeling Savior, an unfeeling Christ. He is full of felt compassion and emotion on your behalf now in heaven. And one reason that that is true is that he is your abiding and unfailing friend. And that takes us to chapter 12 of the book, Christ as our friend. Let's think about that together for a moment. Jesus Christ, for his own people, is their best and dearest and truest friend. Do you think about Jesus as your friend? He is your savior. He is your intercessor. He is your advocate. He is your king and Lord. He is also your truest friend. In fact, right there in the passage where it speaks of Christ as gentle and lowly in heart, just a little bit early in the chapter, Matthew 11, verse 19, Jesus is called the friend of tax collectors and sinners. Who is he the friend to? Is he the friend of those who submit their resumes to him and show him all the good things they have done? Is he the friend of those who say, okay, I have gone to the mission field? No, he is the friend, the text tells us, of those who are sinners. That's who he is the friend to. That's who he is the ally to. That's who he draws near to. That's who he opens his heart to. Those who come to him, who desire him to be their friend, that is exactly what he is and who he is. What does it mean that Jesus Christ is a friend to you or to me, we who are his people? Well, it means he is on our side. It means he opens up his heart and tells us what he is doing in the world. It means that he will never shut you out. You know, given enough offenses, given enough backstabbing, given enough times we mistreat someone, Every human friend, understandably, will finally send up a wall. Every human friend has a limit. Jesus Christ is the one friend who has no limit to what he will put up with for you or for me. The only deal is we have to keep coming to him. That's all. He is not only the King of Kings. He is not only the Lord of Lords. He is also the friend of all friends. So as we think about the heart of Christ, his is a heart of beauty. It is a heart of perfect human emotion. And it is a heart that reflects him as our truest and our dearest friend.